The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure, Chapter 1, The Doctrine of the Real Presence. A certain man was once thrown into prison. He there suffered so much from hunger, thirst, and cold, that at last he was almost dead. One day the king determined to pay a visit to the captive in order to find out how he bore his sufferings. Having put off his royal apparel, he went in disguise to the prison and asked the poor man how he fared. But the prisoner, being very sad and melancholy, scarcely deigned to answer him. When the king had gone away, the jailer said to the criminal, Do you know who was speaking to you? It was the king himself. The king, exclaimed the captive, O oh, wretched that I am! If I had known that, I would have thrown myself at his feet and clasped his knees, and I would not have let him go until he had pardoned me. Alas, what a favorable opportunity I have lost of freeing myself from this dungeon! It was thus the poor captive lamented in anguish and despair, but all was unavailing. I think, dear reader, you understand the meaning of this story. The sufferings of this captive represent the wretchedness of man's condition on this earth. Our true country is heaven. And as long as we are living on earth, we are captives and exiles. We are far from Jesus Christ, our King, far from Mary, our Good Mother, far from the angels and saints of heaven, and far from our dear departed friends. But very many Christians are also, in another respect, like the captives of whom I have spoken. They do not know Jesus Christ, their true King, who not only visits them, but dwells very near them. But, you will ask, how can Jesus Christ dwell near them without their knowing him? It is because he has put on a strange garment and appears in disguise. Our Lord Jesus Christ abides in two places, in heaven, where he shows himself undisguised, as he is in reality, and on earth, in the blessed sacrament, in which he conceals himself under the appearance of bread. One day a certain nun said to St. Teresa, I wish that I had lived at the time of Jesus Christ, my dear Savior, for then I could have seen how amiable and lovely he is. St. Teresa, on hearing this, laughed outright. What? she said. Do you not know then, dear sister, that the same Jesus Christ is still with us on earth? that he lives quite near us in our churches, on our altars, in the Blessed Sacrament? Yes, the Blessed Sacrament, or Holy Eucharist, is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, who is truly, really, and substantially present under the outward appearances of bread and wine. This is indeed a great mystery. And the more to confirm your faith in it, I will give you some proofs for it from scripture and tradition. The first proof is taken from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of St. John. Our divine Savior knew that if he were to teach the Jews and his disciples so new and wonderful a doctrine without having first prepared them for it, there would be scarcely one who would believe him. When God intends to do something very extraordinary, he generally prepares men for it by revealing to them beforehand 
what is what he is about to do. Thus we know that when he intended to destroy the world by the deluge, he made it known through Noah a hundred years before this dreadful event took place. Again, when the Son of God had become man and was about to make himself known as the Redeemer of the world, he sent St. John the Baptist to prepare the people for his coming. Finally, when he intended to destroy Jerusalem, he foretold it by the prophets. And Jesus Christ has also described the signs by which men may know when the end of the world is at hand. God acts thus with men because he does not wish to overwhelm them by his strange and wonderful dealings. Hence, when our divine Savior was about to tell the people that he intended to give him, give them his flesh and blood as food for their souls, he prepared them for this mysterious doctrine by working a very astounding miracle. This great miracle was the feeding of five thousand men with loaves, five loaves and two fishes. The people, having witnessed this miracle, were all so full of reverence for Jesus Christ that they wished to take him by force and make him their king. But Jesus, perceiving this, fled from them. They found him again, however, on the following day. And then Jesus took occasion from the impression the miracle had made on them to introduce the subject of the heavenly food which he was about to give to the world. Amen, said Jesus. I say to you, ye seek me not because you have seen signs, but because ye have eaten of the loaves and have been filled. Labor not for the food which perisheth, but for that which endureth to life everlasting, which the Son of Man will give you. Here he declares that the food he was to give the, them would confer eternal life. Their curiosity being excited by these words, they des desired to know more about this heavenly food and asked what sign he would give them and whether the food he spoke of was better than the manna from heaven which God had given their fathers in the desert. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. In these words, he shows the superiority of this bread to the manna of the Old Testament, calling it the true bread from heaven and saying that it possesses such wonderful efficacy as to give life to the world. The Jews, hearing of so wonderful a kind of bread, said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Whereupon he replied, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the desert and died. This is the bread with which cometh down from heaven, that if any man eat of it, he may not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh 
is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. This disciples, his disciples hearing this said, This saying is hard, and who can hear it? Jesus, knowing that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Does this scandalize you? Observe, he does not say, You are mistaken, you do not understand me. No, on the contrary, he insists still more on the necessity of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Amen, amen, I say unto you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Many of his disciples, continues the evangelist, hearing this, went away and walked no more with him. Jesus, seeing that they would not believe that he was to give them his flesh and blood as food for their souls, suffered them to go away offended. And when they were gone, he said to the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered in the name of all, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and know that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Remark the noble simplicity of the apostles' faith. They believed the words of their master without the least hesitation. They receive his words in that sense in which the other had refused to receive them. They receive them in their obvious meaning as a promise that he would give them his real flesh to eat and his real blood to drink. They believe with a full faith simply because he is the Christ, the Son of God. Too good to deceive and too wise to be deceived. Too faithful to make vain promises and too powerful to find difficulty in fulfilling them. From this time forward, the disciples were constantly expecting that Jesus Christ would fulfill his promise. At length, the long-looked-for day came. At the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and blessed and gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye and eat, for this is my body. Then, taking the chalice, he gave thanks and gave to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which shall be said for many for the remission of sins. Now in these words we must consider especially the speaker. It was God himself. It was the same God who created heaven and earth out of nothing, who in the beginning said, Let, there, let light be made. And in an instant, the sun, the moon, and the stars appeared in the heavens. The same God who once destroyed the whole world, with the exception of eight persons, by water. Who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire from heaven. Who by his servant Moses wrought so many miracles in the sight of Pharaoh and conducted the Israelites out of Egypt making a dry path for them in the midst of the Red Sea. It was the same God, Jesus Christ, who once changed water into wine, who gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the dumb, and life to the dead. Jesus Christ, who ascended into heaven, and who at the end of the world will come again with great majesty in the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead. He it was, the Almighty God, who took bread into his most sacred hands, 
blessed and gave to his disciples, saying, Take ye and eat, for this is my body. And no sooner had he said, This is my body, than the bread was really changed into his body. He it was who in the same manner took the chalice, blessed, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood. And so, no sooner had he said, This is my blood, than the wine was really changed into his blood. When God speaks, what he commands is done in an instant. As he made the sun, the moon, and the stars merely by saying, Let light be made. So also at the Last Supper, by his word alone, he instantaneously changed bread into his body and wine into his blood. To those who doubt this, we may apply the reproof which St. Jane Francis de Chantel once gave to the Calvinist nobleman who was disputing with her father about the real presence. She was at the time only five years of age, but hearing the dispute, she advanced to the heretic and said, What, sir? You do not believe that Jesus Christ is really present in the Holy Eucharist? And yet he has told us that he is present? You then make him a liar. If you dare attack the honor of the king, my father would defend it at the risk of his life and even at the cost of yours. What have you then to expect from God for calling his son a liar? The Calvinist was greatly surprised at the child's zeal and endeavored to appease his young adversary with presents. But full of love for her holy faith, she took his gifts and threw them into the fire, saying, Thus shall all those burn in hell who do not believe the words of Jesus Christ. St. Paul warmly exhorts the Corinthians to flee all communications with idolatry and to abstain from things offered by idols. And he uses the following argument to persuade them. The chalice of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of the Lord? Here he expressly says that in the Holy Eucharist we communicate and partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And still further on, he says, in the same epistles to the Corinthians, Whosoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of our Lord. Nay, he goes farther and says, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. How could the apostle declare that anyone who received Holy Communion unworthily would eat and drink eternal damnation, if such a one did not really receive our Lord? Would it not be absurd to say that a man would incur eternal, eternal damnation by merely eating a piece of bread? or drinking a few drops of wine. But because the apostle, taught by Jesus Christ himself, knew that a, he who receives Holy Communion receives our Lord himself, he declared that to receive it unworthily was to be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and consequently to deserve hellfire. Moreover, all the fathers of the church 
teach the same doctrine as St. Paul. St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, who lived in the first century, wrote as follows to the faithful of Smyrna. Because the heretics refused to acknowledge the Holy Eucharist to be the same flesh which suffered for our sins and was raised again to life by God the Father, they die a miserable death and perish without hope. Tertullian says, Our flesh is nourished with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, in order that our souls may be filled with God himself. Who, asks St. John Chrysostom, will give us of his flesh that we may be filled? This Christ has done, allowing himself not only to be seen, but to be touched too, and to be eaten, to be united to us, thus gratifying all our wishes. Parents often give their children to others to nurse them. Not so do I, says Christ. I nourish you with my flesh and place myself before you. I was willing to become your brother. For your sake I took flesh and blood. And again I deliver to you that flesh and blood by which I became so nearly related to you. In like manner do all the fathers of the church speak that have written upon this subject. <laughs>